Good morning, everyone. Uh, so my name is Andre Richards. I work with the Policing Research Program. And yes, I was the officer in the picture that was used in the beginning. <laughs> um, my colleagues really get a kick out of that picture, so it shows up a little bit of everywhere, as you can understand. <laughs> but that picture does tell an important story. So EMS and fire were on the scene of some shooting, and the news came out there and took the picture. But what that picture says is I was out there rushing to get my notepad out to take some notes. And that's important because I wasn't doing any life-saving measures. I wasn't um, doing scene security because the fire department and EMS were already on scene. They had already taken that care of that stuff. Throughout my law enforcement career, that was the case on many different scenes. Their focus is on something different. So whether it be an accident, CPR, they're out there to do their mission. You're out there to do your mission. Now, if they don't show up or if you're first on scene, of course, you have to handle uh, business for the time being. But what we're finding and across research, it doesn't end up in a vacuum. So earlier, Kevin mentioned um, some issues that we deal with. So we're talking about a lot about homeless. We're talking about opioids. Those issues don't just affect the policing. So even though I work in the policing research program, we cross lines sometimes and we talk to the fire department. We work with the fire department. We work with EMS. And that's why I'm happy to have our first speaker, um, Assistant Chief Andy uh, Sinipoli, uh, with me today. So he's going to be talking a little bit about the Durham gas explosion. Um, some of those local to the area may be familiar with that. Um, some online may not be as familiar with that. But it's something that affected the entire city. But I want everyone to keep in mind that this isn't something that happens a one-off thing. Police and fire, EMS, they have a close working relationship and their relationship occurs all the time. So Assistant Chief Sinipoli has served with the Durham Fire Department for 24 years. He was promoted to the Assistant Chief of Operations in 2013. He is responsible for the coordination and the oversight of the Fire Operations Division and the nine battalion chiefs under that. He's a graduate of the National Fire Academy and holds an, a master's from project management from Western Carolina. And importantly, on April 10th, 2019, he was the incident commander for the Durham gas explosion, which occurred downtown and then ended up killing two people. I'd like to turn it over to Chief uh, Sinipoli. Thank you. Um, Hello, everyone. I appreciate having the opportunity to come and uh, present uh, kind of our experience with the gas explosion downtown. Give you kind of an overview of what happened from our perspective, uh, how we responded to it, and uh, some of the things that we've changed as a result of it, and some of the lessons we learned uh, also as a result of it. So just to give you a general overview of it, um, there were 25 individuals who were injured as part of the gas explosion. Two were deceased. Mr. Lee, the shop owner and Jay Rambo, the gas employee uh, for Dominion Energy. Um, we had a firefighter that was severely injured and spent nine months uh, off the job. Um, and we had six additional firefighters who were on the scene when the explosion occurred and were treated for concussive injuries. There were 18 buildings that contained 23 businesses that were impacted by the explosion. Um, the main north-south thoroughfare was closed for uh, a month. Uh, we had some significant concerns for missing individuals uh, in the collapse there. Um, we had some privacy issues to deal with because there was a Duke Research Lab that was across the street from the explosion. We had the Durham School of the Arts, uh, which was just north of it, which we had to evacuate because uh, it was a school day at that point in time. Uh, and then we had to figure out who was in charge once the, uh, once the incident was over. Uh, traditionally, when the fire department shows up at a fire or has, if we came to RTI for an incident today, um, we would mitigate whatever the problem is and we turn the property back over to RTI because it's a single en entity. But when you have 23 different businesses and 23 different lawyers and 23 different owners, occupants, things like that, it becomes confusing as to who owns that incident after we leave because uh, we're done with our job. Uh, the other complex uh, complexity that came into the incident was Usually when we respond, it's a fire or it's a hazmat incident or it's a building collapse or it's a mass casualty incident or something of that nature. This had all of those. So you had a three alarm fire with a structural collapse with a hazardous materials call and a mass casualty incident. And so that 
tax the resources that we had and put a tax on the strain on the resources throughout the entire county. So that was something that we had to deal with. So uh, kind of going through the timeline of the incident, um, at 913, the first call came out. Uh, a woman was traveling north on Duke Street, and um, she made a cell phone call to 911, said she smelled gas at 400 North, north Duke Street. So that's roughly in the area of the School of the Arts. So anyone's familiar with the area, Station One's across the street from City Hall on Cleveland Street. At that time, an odor of gas with non-specific odor of gas gets one unit, got one engine. They would go check on it. All of our engines carry a four gas meter and they're able to do gas detection on a rudimentary level just to narrow it down. So engine one responded. When they responded, they came up and went through West Village on Morgan Street, which took them north of where the line was broken, where the actual line was broken. So once they passed it, if anyone's driven through that intersection, there's a huge gas appliance that sits right there at the intersection of Morgan and Duke Street. And there's a relief valve there that vents gas on the system when it overpressurizes. Uh, so it's not unusual, it's not uncommon for us to get gas leak calls there or odors of gas there. Uh, they drove past it, thought perhaps that was what it was, that perhaps her car got filled with that gas. They made a right turn, went up Duke Street uh, towards the School of the Arts, didn't smell anything, didn't see anything, completely looped the block, called back to the 911 center and asked if there were any additional calls on the, uh, on the incident. They said, no, it was just a single caller. So they believed it to be unfounded, uh, that perhaps that there was some overpressure in the system, it vented some gas, and that's what the uh, individual, um, that's what the individual smelled when they came through. So they went back to the station. Uh, unbeknownst to them, PS splicing uh, had broken a line, had uh, in a boring operation, had broken a line um, just kind of up the street. This is something that we've been dealing with quite a bit as they're laying fiber and cable throughout all of Durham. Uh, we run five or six gas leak calls a day where a subcontractor has bored into a gas line um, because of one reason or another. Uh, so again, uh, it was one of these calls prior to April 10th that was routine for us that we didn't put a whole lot of stock in. All right. Okay. Um, it was something that we were relatively comforted. It, it would never amount to anything and they were always outside. The gas was always outside and would dissipate up in the air and it was never a problem. Uh, we would call at that time, it was public service gas. They would come, they would dig, shut the leak off and we would be fine. So that was kind of the assumption that was going on. Second call comes in at around 9.37 uh, from 911 for a gas leak at 115 North Duke Street. So again, engine one, same truck is dispatched. Uh, this time it's a confirmed line break. So we sent a ladder company, the big truck tandem axle with the ladder on top. They have more sensitive meters on them so they can do a little bit more. They can sense a little bit more. They can narrow the leak down a little bit more. Um, so those two trucks were dispatched to the 115 North Duke Street gas call. Thinking that it was somehow still an unfounded call because of the initial one. We had been through there already. The captain on the engine company turned the ladder around, said, you know, I'll call you if I need you. But I have a feeling this is gonna be unfounded just as the first one does. So this time they actually go up Main Street instead of Morgan uh, and come in from that side. They see the construction operation, they get off, they can smell a little bit of gas, they can hear it. Uh, and so that they see there is actually a line breaker of an issue there. They get off the truck, um, they start investigating. Uh, they pull off the gas meter, they go into the business caffeinate, which is full of customers at the time, and the gas meter pegs. Now, um, as, I mean, as everyone knows, or everyone may not know, uh, natural gas is odorless. Uh, and so they add mercaptan, the rotten egg smell, to the gas afterward in order to give it a smell. And so that's how you're able to detect it more often than not as you smell it. Um, however, there are certain soils that can strip the mercaptan out of the gas. And so looking back, um, that seems to be what happened in this case and is the reason why all of these businesses were still occupied, even though there was, uh, I believe, 70,000 cubic feet of gas inside caffeinate at the time of the explosion. So they get off the truck, the gas meter pegs, but they don't smell anything. Um, so they become concerned. They call back for the ladder truck, says, hey, this 
is bigger than what we thought it was going to be. Y'all please come on out here. Uh, so they start making their way out. The captain decides that they're going to start evacuating the businesses. So they start going on either side and evacuating the uh, individuals from the different businesses that are there. And what was our standard practice at that time was to pull a hose line. In, in the event that there was some sort of an ignition, we would have uh, deployed a hose line. So firefighter Darren Wheeler uh, pulled the hose line and stood next to the truck, um, kind of manning that with all of his gear on. So um, the, uh, the ladder truck's coming. They're starting to evacuate. They get most of the buildings evacuated. Uh, then they start to have a discussion with Mr. Lee, who doesn't want to leave the, uh, his occupancy. Uh, they have uh, back and forth with the captain, but he's unable to convince him that he needs to leave. So uh, he calls the police department. He calls for a police officer to come by uh, because we can't put our hands on anybody and we're not going to put our hands on anybody. So he calls for the police department to come by. So the uh, police department comes and ends up at the intersection of um, Duke and Maine. So the individual, uh, our captain walks out, sees the police car, starts walking towards the, uh, the um, police car at uh, Duke and Maine and the building explodes. So, um, Uh, when the building exploded, uh, picked up firefighter Darren Wheeler and threw him into the truck. Um, it uh, knocked him to the ground, and uh, he was uh, injured pretty significantly. Uh, his first instinct was to kind of check himself and make sure all of his parts were still there. They all were. Um, he was then uh, dragged out of the way by a number of our firefighters and dragged to a safe location. Uh, and I think everybody's probably heard the audio of our folks on the radio calling for help. So the initial call came from the captain. He tried to get up uh, with a battalion chief for the area and asked for um, a two alarm fire assignment to the, that they had had a huge explosion to the building and a collapse of it. Now, this was a normal day in Durham to start off with. And so we were going about our business and our normal routine. We had some training going on off Ellis Road. And so roughly a quarter of our units were over on Ellis Road doing some training on some uh, houses where they're gonna put a neighborhood in. And so he made the call over there, they canceled that training and started bringing trucks back into town. Um, EMS got dispatched as well. <clears throat> and uh, uh, when the EMS dispatcher, I think everybody's heard that, asked how many do you want? And uh, our guy said, just send me everything you have and I'll tell you when to stop. Um, they started taking patients to both intersections. Uh, they started pulling patients to um, the North Duke and Main Street intersection and Duke and Morgan Street intersection, which caused a little bit of confusion uh, in getting units to the scene and where we wanted folks to go. Uh, and so uh, there's footage of Zerm PD helping to, to tend to victims. So it was pretty much an, an all hands on deck thing. So um, we've got some uh, body cam footage of Zerm police evacuating buildings and helping uh, pull. So like Andre had mentioned before, um, this is one of the few places that I've ever worked where the police, fire, EMS, everybody operates as a single unit, even though you know we work for different agencies, we operate as a single unit. Um, and so you don't really see that in a lot of other municipalities. And so when something like this happens, it, it's really great to see that, that everybody can work together as effectively and efficiently as they do. So now we have a, uh, an explosion with a um, structural collapse. The occupant, Mr. Lee, is still in the building. Um, he is visible to the individual, so they start trying to make a rescue effort with him. Uh, there's a gas-fed fire that's going on because the gas is still active. Um, so they're trying to do that while they're trying to fight that fire, or at least protect it while they get him out. The, when the building exploded, Mr. Lee was trapped under um, several pieces of metal I-beam and eventually had to be re um, removed from the building using a cutting torch from the urban search and rescue team that came out of Raleigh. That was the only way to get him out of the building. Um, so when it, uh, and when it exploded, everybody started coming out. It happened to be the 150th anniversary of the city. Um, so we had a lot of our staff that was downtown for a, a special 
event that was going on. Our fire chief was actually emceeing that event. Um, so the staff kind of made its way. Everybody kind of migrated over to the scene to try and get control of it. So the easiest thing to do was to break it down by task group. So we broke it down by a fire suppression group to take care of the fire issue. We had the EMS group to take care of the uh, mass casualty issue. We had a search and rescue group to look for searching for victims uh, and a hazmat group to search for hazmat. Uh, what we were finding was the same level of gas in the manholes. We started popping manholes and we were getting 100% of the lower explosive limit in all of these manholes. So realizing we were taxed at that point, we made a request to the city of Raleigh for the regional response hazardous materials team throughout the state. There are state funded hazardous materials teams uh, and we made that request to them. We made it formally through EM, but because we have a lot of relationships and because we train very well together, we actually made a phone call that preceded that and said, hey, look, we've just had an explosion collapse, huge gas explosion, need you guys to start heading this way. Uh, the same was true of Urban Search and Rescue Task Force 8. We made that formal request, that's a state funded team. We made that request formally through emergency management, but because we have some task force leaders that work for us, again, we made that on the phone uh, to get those folks there. So uh, once we got kind of everything settled, um, then we were able to go about kind of trying to account for everyone. And that was one of the biggest challenges was trying to account for everybody. Uh, once we packed up and shipped everyone out to the hospital, we had a difficult time tracking with patient tracking and figuring out who went where, who originated from where, and did we clear out the buildings. Um, there was, uh, we were told that there were two women that were in one of the buildings still, that they were not at one of the hospitals, that they could not be contacted and accounted for, and they were in one of the buildings um, that was inside the collapse zone in the collapsed area. So we expended a significant amount of time and effort. We used search dogs, cameras, things like that to try and search that area. Turns out they weren't there. Um, so uh, that was difficult for us. One of the other challenges we had when looking at accountability is our own accountability. So when something like this happens, uh, it goes out over the news, Sky Five's overhead taking pictures of it, and all of our off-duty personnel see it. Now we have a policy and procedure, which no one reads, about what happens to come when you come back into work, right? Like when we have a, a disaster and we need you to come back and backfill, we've got that, it's very clear, no one read that. Uh, we had people, spontaneous responders to the scene. People would just show up. We had one guy hijack an Uber and showed up at the scene. Um, and so we had, in addition to having unaccounted for civilians, we had unaccounted folks of our own. Uh, and when we're trying to track injured uh, person, to make sure we've accounted for all of our injuries and make sure we're not missing anybody, we're looking around and there's extra people there that don't belong. Uh, after you've been uh, with fire long enough, even though we have that big costume on with all the gear on, you get to know people and know what they look like with their gear on. They walk a certain way, they put their gear on a certain way, they have a little swagger or whatever, and the name doesn't match the body in there. And so I started spinning people around and looking at them and I'm like, hey, that doesn't, they would go to a station, grab whatever gear fit and showed up at the scene. Um, so that was a huge problem that we needed to overcome and that, that we've kind of since, well, we had addressed it, we just kind of readdressed it to make sure that they've read that now. Um, one of the other challenges was not having a staging area. So everybody piled into the scene, which blocked, direct, which blocked out traffic in all, to all compass points. Um, PD did a great job. They staged at the police headquarters and then kind of shuttled their folks in. We did a terrible job and we're supposed to be experts at it. And all of our folks, like a moth to the flame, everybody just piled in. So that made it difficult for EMS to get their ambulances in and out when all of our fire trucks had piled in on top of it. So uh, that was something that, that we learned from it as well, that we needed to set up a staging area. Public information uh, was another issue that we kind of overcame. There was all the public information officers were there because they were celebrating the 150th anniversary of the city of Durham. Um, but we didn't get a lot of those folks down to our scene and our site in a timely manner to get like the appropriate information out. So if you can imagine, you have the Durham School of the Arts that's sitting there with all those children in it, people are turning on the TV, or if they've signed up for Alert Durham, they're getting a page on their phone that there's been a huge explosion next to the school. All those parents are coming to get their kids, right? So 
that's further complicates it now that we have to evacuate the school and get folks out of there. Uh, so that was a, a kind of a big headache as well to try and work through that um, situation uh, as well. Some of the other things that um, we had to look at that we didn't think of kind of going into it is um, there's a great picture of me that thankfully isn't public of me walking through the scene with uh, fully encapsulating vapor protecting Costa Del Mar sunglasses on and that's pretty much it. Uh, so not wearing any gear at all and of course with a building of that age there's tons of asbestos in it and so as a result of the explosion uh, and those of us who walked through and were exposed to it we had 97 individuals uh, from our department that we had to send for testing uh, to, the, the, um, to the doctor. Uh, they had to get chest x-rays, a full workup, and then they're going to be monitored for um, the rest of their career while they're with us because they were exposed to asbestos. Um, so that was something that, that uh, one of the challenges that we had to overcome. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other stuff. Um, Uh, so I guess managing expectations is another one. So when you have a large um, incident like that and you have a large explosion like that, um, it's a, it becomes a political issue. Um, so that's a main, a huge thoroughfare from north to south. And there were folks that wanted it opened as soon as possible. Uh, but that's unreasonable and it's not going to happen in a timely manner. There's investigations that have to go on uh, for days and weeks to follow. Um, and so, you know, there, there has to be on some level an understanding of how that works. And so we all teach NIMS and incident command and, and all of those things. And at a task level, it works well. When the people on the street, it works well. But when you move into more administrative folks or think people that don't typically use it, um, it tends to fall apart and doesn't work as well. And so there's a breakdown in the information and understanding of, of how things work and how things are going to go and how incidents are managed. Um, so that was a big kind of learning experience and something that we needed to push out there. So things that we've done since the gas explosion, um, as I said, they were routine emergencies to us to begin with, where we just kind of sent um, minimal uh, resources to that. We've now, we overreacted uh, in the hindsight and we sent a full hazardous materials response to it now, which amounted to 40 people roughly going to an odor of gas. So we've taken a step back now and looked at right sizing that response and looking at the risk and the value and the associated risk of putting that many people on the road running lights and sirens up and down there, the risk to the individuals and the civilians on there and whether it's worth it to, or can we just send a little bit more than what we had before to, um, to mitigate that incident or to make better decisions. We also don't pull a hose line anymore. Uh, we use the truck and we park back and use the truck as a shield now and park it in a certain way. Um, the engine that was there uh, took the full front of the blast wave, uh, but it still operated. It still pumped on that fire for three, three and a half hours, uh, even though it, it got blown pretty much to pieces. Um, but it, it did protect the individual that walked behind it to go to the police officer, uh, whereas the individual who was manning the hose line, not so much. Um, it took him nine months of rehab to get back to us before he came back. And uh, unfortunately for him, the first fire he came back to us on, he got extremely dehydrated and had to be transported to the hospital again. So I'm not sure how his wife lets us work for him anymore because that would have been the second phone call she got that your husband's in the hospital. Uh, so I'm not sure why she lets him continue to work for us. But um, yeah, those were the, so those are the, the kind of big takeaways from it. Um, are there any questions that anyone has? Yes. Hello. Sorry. Um, so you mentioned a bunch of partnerships as far as the hazardous materials and the gas companies. So I'm just curious about how you were able, were those pre-existing, um, did those develop more after the situation um, and how you're able to develop those collaborations so you guys could work together and move quicker to respond to the situation? Yeah, so those, um, they already exist. 
So uh, the individual, Jay Rambo, everybody in the fire department knew him by name. Uh, we respond to, like I said, five, six gas calls a day, typically. And uh, he was a public service gas employee. They come and they do training for us and they teach classes for us. And so we get to know them over a course of a period of time in working with them. Uh, we do uh, an extensive amount of training with the city of Raleigh. So if you remember not too long ago, there was a trench uh, collapse in Briar Creek where both the city of Raleigh and the city of Durham were both uh, kind of doing a trench rescue there. So everybody essentially knows everybody by first name or on a first name basis because we train so much together and we work so much together that those relationships have been ongoing since I've been here, since I've been with the department. So um, it's, it's nice to see. And so like I said, I've been here 24 years and the same people that I knew from the police department that were patrol officers. And so they've kind of moved up at a parallel course through their organization. So, you know, we basically know uh, all of us still know each other having started and moved up through the various organizations together. So those relationships have developed over just a long time uh, of working together. So, and again, here in Durham, it um, is the only place I've seen where uh, you could have uh, cardiac arrest and you could have a police officer doing chest compressions and a firefighter doing the bag valve mass and a medic pushing um, drugs to the patient. So, I mean, they, it is really a cohesive group here in Durham, uh, unlike I've seen kind of, I've worked in other areas and unlike I've seen uh, anywhere else. So, um, yeah. Uh, Chief, thank you so much for that. I'm thank thinking this is all. Oh, go ahead. Um, I have a question about the school's response, especially as a mother of two Durham Public School children. Mm -hmm. um, have you all worked with the schools now to figure out in the future if there is something like that? Is there a better coordinated response um, as far as information and then clearing the buildings and, and moving those kids out to a safe place? Sure. Um, I believe they sheltered in place to begin with. And in some cases, we will shelter in place depending on access, depending on, on what the risk is. Um, there may be a better idea to shelter in place and just leave them there than to try and move them out depending on what the hazard is. Uh, it's basically, in this case, they weren't in any real danger. It was kind of a perception of, uh, is a panic. As a, I mean, I'm a parent. If, if it had happened to my kid, I'd have gone down there. Um, but it's, uh, it's really a public um, messaging issue, getting, pushing it out to the different social media feeds, getting out ahead of it. And that's one of the things we tried to stress with the PIOs afterwards when we had an after action. Like, this is something you need to get out ahead of. We don't need to be playing catch up. As soon as it explodes, you know this is going to happen. These streets are going to be closed. People are going to be worried about this. There's a school here. Everyone's going to want to know. The same way with an uh, active assailant on a school campus, you're going to want to get out ahead of that and let people know a, what the issue is, B, that are the children safe, C, what the plan is for getting them out of there. And so we do work with the school system on different protocols and how to work best with them uh, to get out, to, to kind of evacuate. And I think in this instance, we turned it over to, the, to law enforcement and said, hey, we've got this thing over here to deal with. Can you guys go ahead and, and manage the logistics of getting the school evacuated, whether it's just getting them on buses and relocating them or, or getting them in and out? Because the normal like drop off pickup thing isn't isn't going to work out in this in this particular incident. So, yeah, yeah. Got a question from online. In hindsight, how soon do you involve the PD to respond with the gas smells? Uh, pretty much the same, or did that change? So we um, we've. Depending on the nature of the call, if it looks like we're going to need to close roads, we have PD respond immediately to them to get there. In this instance, we should have closed Duke Street immediately. Looking back on it, we should have closed, we should have immediately closed Duke Street. And so we should have involved law enforcement earlier than we had. But yeah, going forward, we do call out to, we had on Avondale Drive, a um, couple of, I guess a month later, we had a similar incident um, where we were getting the same levels of gas in an underground, um, underground lines. And we had PD just completely lock the area down pretty quickly. Um, so we do involve them a lot quicker than we have in the past. Thank you. And one thing. Sorry. Sorry. How many agencies coordinated with ERAP, Emergency Response Action Plan? I don't know that any did. Okay. 
the some agencies are dedicated for that one um if they are i'm not aware of it okay thank you mm -hmm. Hi there. I was just wondering um, what sorts of supportive services were available to your staff after the incident um, in terms of, you know, self-care and wellness. And yeah, I neglected to mention it and you probably saw it a minute ago. Um, we have the North Carolina Peer Support Network for firefighters. It's um, uh, counselors that are our fire personnel that, um, that will come and, and talk and, and work with you um, because sometimes firefighters feel better talking to a firefighter than to a stranger. Uh, and so we've offered that service up to all of our folks and we've had them go through several sessions of it. Um, we also, the day of, um, we have a couple of firefighters that are uh, chaplains with the department. So one of them was a battalion chief on the call and as soon as we cleared him off, we immediately sent him to start talking to the individuals that were involved. Um, but you could see it still impacts them. And one of the issues that, um, one of the issues that we're having now is the, you know, the anniversary is coming up. And so the, they keep wanting to trot out these guys. The, they had to throw out the first pitch at the Bulls game. They were mentioned at the State of the City address the other night. They, they keep putting these folks front and center, and they just soon forget that day ever happened. And uh, so there, I, we, we keep kind of saying, hey, look, you, you need to let these guys, folks, be alone. You know, you need to let them deal with it. Every time you put them in front of something else, it just brings all that up again. Um, so um we're trying to find a happy medium for there we give them the option um and tell them hey like if you don't want to go don't well I, you know we'll find somebody else to to go and represent the fire department for whatever reason um please don't feel obligated but it is something that we're starting to see that we're going to end up dealing with we had thought kind of we were behind it uh, but now with the anniversary of it coming up we're starting to see hey we want to see these guys we want to celebrate these folks we want to bring them up again and they're like yeah just no Thank you. Um, I have a question, or not a question, but I wanted to respond to um, the question on the um, parents and the, the school response. I was actually, or I am a parent, um, and just wanted to say that I, um, within the timing was probably felt like an eternity, but um, the school did respond, like within 20 or 30 minutes, they were reaching out to all of the parents by phone and by email to let them know. Um, but again, lessons learned are that not both parents are necessarily assigned to that. So one parent may know, one may not. Mm -hmm. And then of course, with um, social media and the fact that the kids have their phones with them, a lot of times the kids will be notifying their parents before that action mm -hmm. had gone into place. So you get parents reacting to it and getting there. But they did let us know as soon as they could what the, the circumstances were and they did ask us not to come to the school that it was being um, you know addressed and that we would be notified as to where the students could be picked up and all of that um, as well so I think that um, maybe because y'all did a really good job um, it seemed like an eternity but I do think that the parents were notified and um, we were reassured of the circumstances as soon as we could get well, that's good to hear Question over here. Immediately after the explosion, what was the communication like between the fire department and Dominion Energy and in terms of the ability to, you know, cut off the source of the gas leak and, and did it, was at that point, were you still thinking gas leaks priority? I mean, obviously other things were priorities at that point, but what did that transition look like? So yeah, competing priorities essentially, because um, you had the collapse. We knew we had one person trapped there and we could see that individual. We knew we had a gas fed fire that we could sort of hold in check for a little bit. We knew we had a number of individuals. The priority at the time was to try and hold the fire in check and get all the injured off the scene as quickly as possible uh, and locate all of the injured because it did damage. Um, I've got pictures of inside of the Duke building across the street where it just um, destroyed the inside of that. The blast, the blast wave went completely through there. Um, so those were the priorities. Duke Energy had other individuals there um, with Mr. Rambo. And so we immediately talked to them and they were kind of like, hey, we need to get it shut. We need to shut the valves down. So they immediately went to work isolating the area by shutting down their mains and their valves. Um, but they're pretty good about that. 
uh, and we've worked with them enough where um, obviously they had one of theirs that was injured and we were tending to them, but they were extremely professional and went about going ahead and shutting the gas down and isolating kind of that area because of the damage that was done there. But again, in one of those, it's the priority is life safety, right? We need to get everybody off the scene uh, as we can and, and get them, you know, to the hospital as, as quickly as possible and make sure we've accounted for everybody that's, uh, that's there. So, um, and I think the, the other big thing that I guess I would mention uh, from maybe a business standpoint is your continuity of operations. Like those businesses are closed for a long time. And the, a lot of the data, a lot of the computers, a lot of the servers are destroyed. Uh, and unless that stuff's backed up somewhere, unless you have other ways to get a hold of it, unless you have other means to get it, then, you know, that's kind of, um, you're kind of at a loss there. I want to touch on one other point um, based on what Hope asked as far as what support that the firefighters have. Uh, you also mentioned um, personnel that were re-injured on different scenes after. Um, so there's a long-term after effects and there might be some personnel that maybe they don't have as much time as you do on the job. Maybe they started two years ago and this is one of their first big incidents. So they're going to carry that for a career. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to talk about support a little bit because there are many other incidents that the fire department goes to. They may, you know, do CPR on an infant that doesn't make it. They may go to car accidents where someone doesn't make it. If I've noticed if you ride with a person that's been in law enforcement for a long time, uh, EMS or the fire department, if you ride around the town where they worked, they'll start saying, well, hey, on this block, I did CPR over here. This block, I broke my ankle. Um, this block over here, I went to a shooting and this person died. It gets depressing. Um, so I wanted to know a little bit about the support over the long term and how people respond to that. So it's something new for the fire service, right? And I really think it, it came out of the kind of the global wars and seeing what the veterans are going through that and realizing that it's going to be a long term thing that it, it was not something that that was really focused on for the fire service on the last couple of years. But if you look at it statistically now with public safety employees with fire in general, more um, firefighters die from suicide than they do from on the job injuries or on the job, things like that. So we lose more people to suicide than we do. So mental health is a huge issue and we're way behind on addressing that as a, as a, uh, as a unit, as a group, as an organization or an industry, I guess. So uh, again, they're trying to, they're offering a lot of training and a lot of counseling. They're trying to, you know, they have the network of emergency chaplains. They have the firefighter peer support group. They have employee assistance. So they're really pushing a lot of those things to try and catch those. And we're also sending all of our folks through training to kind of look for warning signs that you could see in people that, that you know, maybe their behavior's a little off, maybe it changes, maybe they're not reacting the way that you think they should be reacting or, or you know, looking for triggers that might, and then having that conversation and not thinking that it's a weakness to, to show that, that, it, that it's impacting you. So, but yeah, you're, they could have, uh, we've had, gosh, we've had some folks here recently that have had some really bad, really bad scenes, right? Like you see the most horrific stuff ever, um, uh, uh, you know, on a daily basis. And you have to somehow process that. And for a long time, most people just swallowed it. I mean, I did it, right? Like. I swallowed it and ate it. And it's, it's a terrible way. Like it's no way to deal with it. Um, you end up kind of almost like a robot, you know, and that's just not the way to go through life because at some point it's all going to come out. Uh, you know, it's just a matter of when. And so uh, again, as an industry, it, it's something we're really trying to come to grips with now and get on top of now because it's, you know, once you see the statistics on it, um, it, it really kind of hits home. Thank you so much. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? Um, we can, uh, thank you so much, Chief. Yeah.